What's up guys, welcome back to Probing Paul. This is episode number 68, my tech and random Q&A where I answer questions, some of them about technology, some of them are random. And today I'm gonna to be addressing a very, very important question about NVMe SSDs. No, not what capacity you should get or what manufacturer or what controller it should use, but what about the sticker? Do you leave the sticker on or do you take it off? Excellent. We begin as always with a reminder that this is not my first time. I have been probed many times, and in fact, there's a playlist if you wanna check it out. Um, we're getting we're getting pretty close to that magic number here. But all the questions I'm gonna to answer today were asked in the comments of the last probing poll, so feel free to leave me a comment if you would like to ask me a question that maybe I'll answer next time. Let's start off with the first question from Gamer Dude, who says, hey Paul, great channel. Thank you, Gamer Dude. Should you take the sticker off the NVMe, NVMe SSD or should you leave it on? The short answer is you should leave it on, but I'm gonna explain why and maybe maybe a couple other details about these NVMe SSDs that maybe you didn't know before. But the reason people ask this question in the first place is that NVMe SSDs are somewhat known for getting a little hot. And this doesn't happen with all of them across the board, but especially when you get to the higher end NVMe SSDs like the PCIe 4.0 ones that actually bump up against the barriers of the available bandwidth of PCIe 4.0 or PCIe 3.0 if uh, that's the type of drive that you have. And if they get really hot, they will slow themselves down. So that's the first point to make is that even if you are in a thermally limited scenario if you're installing it into a laptop or something like that, or just a situation where you don't have a lot of airflow, an SSD should throttle itself or slow itself down if it's actually overheating before it actually causes any damage to the drive itself, and pretty much every SSD has that built in to some degree. But what if you don't want your fancy NVMe SSD to slow itself down? Well, then you wanna keep it a little bit cooler, and there's a few different ways to do that. One is to make sure that you have airflow going over it, but that's not always an option. And then another option or solution is to have a heat sink on it. And there's a lot of different heat sinks, some that come with the SSD itself, some that are aftermarket that you can buy and add on if you have a standard M.2280 SSD like this one. But if you've ever installed something like a CPU before and you know that there's a CPU and a heat spreader and a heat sink that goes on top of that with thermal paste in between, and it's very important to get good contact and good pressure between the cooling solution and the CPU to make sure you have ideal heat transfer between them, then you might look at something like this and be like, oh, this SSD has a sticker. Am I gonna put a heat sink right on top of that? Is the sticker going to impede the transfer of heat between the hot elements on the SSD and the uh, cooler or the heat sink or whatever I stick on top of that? So the first reason to not be very concerned about that is that pretty much every SSD manufacturer that I've ever spoken to tells me that the stickers that they use on these are specifically meant to be thermally conductive. So basically these are special stickers. They're not just like a normal type of uh, sticker or label that they stick on there. They're made to conduct the heat and to help transfer it from the NAND or the controller up into your heatsink or I guess up into the air if you're not putting a heatsink on it. And then the other thing to consider with NVMe SSDs in particular is that you have uh, different components that are on the PCB itself and you can see this Kyoxia SSD right here. These larger uh, rectangular units here, and there are four of them, are the actual NAND and that's what actually stores your data. Then you're going to have a controller which is this square right here. And then you might have some supplemental DRAM that acts as a cache and that's what this chip is. Here. Here's another example. You can see the NAND chips down on this end of the SSD. You can see a Fizon controller right here and you can see a supplemental DRAM chip right there. Not every SSD uses a DRAM chip for cache. Some will just set aside some of the NAND flash and will uh, often operate it in SLC mode instead of MLC mode and that sort of functions as a cache. And the last little bonus point I want to make here is that the NAND is actually okay being warm. The NAND actually performs better if it's a little warmer when it's doing read and write operations. The uh, controller chip is the one that will warm up and get hot, and if it gets too hot, that's the one that you have to worry about overheating. So that may or may not have practical use for you. You might have an SSD that looks like this with a big old sticker, and you can't really tell what's underneath it or what's going on where. But if you have an M.2 NVMe SSD and you notice that it's running warm if you're monitoring the temperatures, or if you notice that your read and write speeds are dropping after a sustained read and write operations for quite some time, which is likely due to heat buildup, then consider uh, a heat sink on your SSD. Yes, you can plop it right on top of the sticker if needs be. But also just as a point of practicality, note that the thing that you're actually trying to keep cool is the controller and uh, the NAND flash is actually less of a concern. Moving on to the next question though from Avid Tech User. Hey Paul, great channel, thank you Avid Tech User. I was just wondering if you, when, when you first started your channel, did you do anything to promote it or did you just let it grow organically? I cannot claim to have just grown my channel organically because I actually started doing YouTube back in 2009. So I worked at the popular online retailer Newegg from uh, 2005 until I wanna say 
2014 or so, and uh, I started doing YouTube videos there. In fact, this was my first one. It was a Samsung netbook review, and as you can see, we totally had figured out stuff like the aspect ratio. We were using like a camera that just some guy who also worked there happened to have. It's a 480 video. That's what we were uploading back then. So that was in July of 2009, and then uh, if, so if you go to the Newegg channel and you sort by the oldest videos, you can see some of my older ones back when I was working alongside Laura, who also did PR and stuff for Newegg. Got to go to BlizzCon 2009. I think this was my first video at Newegg that actually got fairly big. It's up to 250, 260,000 views now. This was my Windows 7 review and installation walkthrough that went really well. And I, I shot this in my old apartment with my uh, room, my old roommate Chad's, you know the Chad PC? Uh, this is his dog, Guinness. Guinness has since passed away, so rip Guinea Bear. But I guess what I'm saying is that I, I definitely had a head start, and this is why when people ask me about, you know, starting a YouTube channel and stuff, I'm always like, you know, do it because you're passionate about it, because you may or may not actually get the uptake and views and popularity and stuff that you need in order to sustain it as a full-time job. It wasn't until 2011 that I did my uh, How to Build a PC video that actually took off uh, quite a lot, and this one's at 3.7 million views or so as of now. Every once in a while, these videos will come up because of, I'm doing something like this and I like to look at like them. Look, someone commented on this video one day ago. And apparently I, I look quite, I, yeah, I guess I do look younger there. But yeah, from 2009 to 2013, 2014 or so, I was making videos on Newegg and then I started my channel, uh, which I posted the first video to on October 4th, 2012. And those were kind of going side by side for a while. I still did videos with Newegg through 2014. There's, uh, this is one of the ones I did with me and Kyle, the how to, PC, how to build a PC video in 2014. But it was absolutely a kickstart to uh, have some of the exposure that I had on Newegg and working with Newegg TV. So that as I started to produce and post videos on my own channel, um, they, they started doing pretty decently well right off the bat. I didn't have to sort of build up from zero. I had a bit of a following already and that was really, really helpful. Hopefully from there, it just grew organically, but beyond that, I can't really give any like advice to people like, hey, go back and work at Newegg in 2008 or 2009 when you know social media and YouTube was really just starting to get rolling and then you can get yourself in a good situation. It's a much more different and challenging landscape on YouTube now for anyone trying to make tech videos. And there's lots of people who start out who don't have that kind of push, who might make really, really good videos, but they might burn out or just not get the views that they're hoping for because it's such a saturated market now. So, so that's why the advice I always give to people is like I said, make videos because you enjoy making the videos because you're making something that you're happy with and not to be seeking the views or having the goal of making it a long-term like full-time job. That's not to say you can't do that eventually if your videos do start to get some uptake on them, but that's just the advice I give to people because, because I think you should approach something like making videos on YouTube with a rational frame of mind and you shouldn't get your hopes up too much because there's plenty of videos you can watch from people who are really popular and you could look at that and be like, oh my gosh, I could do that too. But it's never the same story of how people got to where they are. And there's often a lot of work that went into it years prior before they hit that 1 million plus view video that actually got them the broader audience and had the subscribers start to pour into the point where they started making a reasonable amount of money at it. Next question is from Nathan Smith. Since the 3070 Ti, 3080 Ti came out, I feel like non-Ti model production has slowed down. Do you think GPU manufacturers have or will slow down production on the non-Ti because the Ti profit margins are higher? So I'll start off my answer by saying, I'm speculating here and I do not know this for sure, but I am strongly inclined to believe that you are correct. And manufacturers absolutely do prioritize making products that have higher profit margins, that they can make more money on for less investments of work or uh, materials. So consider, if you will, a GPU wafer. This is what's produced by um, certain fabs. And this is just an image I'm using as an example, but it's a big round thing. And then there's a bunch of individual dies and each of these dies might represent a GPU. NVIDIA's current GPUs are codenamed Ampere and they're working with Samsung to manufacture them. And Samsung has a fab that can produce these wafers using their eight nanometer technology. NVIDIA has a certain allotment of time to use Samsung's fab, but it's up to NVIDIA what they're actually going to produce. A wafer like this is going to produce all of the same chip, and that might be, for example, NVIDIA's GA104, uh, the Ampere 104 codenamed chip, but then that chip will be tested and binned out, and they'll decide, okay, based on its performance, the frequencies it can hit and whatnot, or whether there's certain parts of the chips that aren't functional, they can then integrate that chip to make a 3060 Ti, or a 3070, or a 3080, with the GA104 in particular. There's also a GA102 that's used for the 3080 and 3080 Ti, I, and there's a uh, GA106 and 107. Uh, well, the 107 isn't out yet, but the 106 is what's uh, used for the RTX 3060s. 
360, for example. So knowing that NVIDIA gets to make the call as to what Samsung produces on their fabs and the amount of time that they have to produce NVIDIA products, uh, it's pretty easy to say that, yeah, what they're probably gonna do is say, let's make more of the chips that we can use for 3080 Ti's that cost $1,200 versus 3070's or 3080's that cost 600 or 700, if you're going for the MSRP, of course. And that's what came out in the past few weeks saying uh, they're expecting NVIDIA's GPU volume to be down by about 30% was me thinking like, all right, they're taking their yields from the fabs and they're setting aside a bunch of chips to build up enough inventory to launch a whole new range of products, which is now again being rumored to be the RTX 30 Super Series, which is rumored to launch in early 2022. So I applaud your cynicism, Nathan Smith, and thank you very much for the question. Moving on to Gaust99, who says, uh, I like probing Paul videos. Well, good, good. Do you miss attending expos such as Computex in person? Uh, do you think that in the future when the pandemic is gone, you could actually be in the mood to attend attend expos or continue receiving your information through the internet. I absolutely love going to events. I don't love going to them all the time. There's definitely, like, I don't want to sign up for, for a couple every month or something like that. Um, but this is one of my more recent videos from CES from January 2019. This is a little bit of the room tour. But getting to do a little bit of travel, uh, you know, Joe, I, I can even tolerate Joe sharing a hotel room with a Joe. Net <laughs> But getting to do a bit of travel, uh, sharing a hotel room with Joe, which, you know, it's, it's gotten easier over the years. It's, it's great. And what I really, really, really like is being able to go and see people at these events and talk to them in person rather than through the internet or Twitter interactions or whatever. Like Luke is one of my favorite people over at LMG and, and I love every time I get to hang out with him and talk for a little bit. It also coincides with Joe's birthday, uh, at least for CES in January. And that's what this particular dinner was. I remember I was actually it's actually kind of lit on, on, during that dinner because um, it was the end of the week. <clears throat> all right, that's, that's all I need to say about that. So yes, I miss them. Yes, I want to get back, but uh, we're going to wait until things are nice and safe to do that again because it's not really necessary to go to these events. It's just really nice to do because, um, you know, seeing people and talking in person, um, it's, it's good to be able to do that from time to time. All right, a few more questions. Neo Chaos X, uh, on your videos where you're sitting in your desk, I've noticed your RGB keyboard has a keycap with your thumbscrew logo on it that's backlit with the thumbscrew keycap on my store isn't backlit. Can we get a backlit version? All right, so here's the keycap that's on my store and it's actually sold out. It's uh, t typically sells for $4.75. And here, I don't know how well you can see this or how dusty this keyboard actually is, is the keycap that Cooler Master made and sent for me when uh, they sent this keyboard over, which uh, this is the MK850, by the way, from Cooler Master. It's, it's been a nice keyboard for me. I should dust it off. Long story short, I talked to my merch guy about this recently and the keycaps that work with RGB that let the light shine through, they cost a little bit more. So what I'm trying to say is that yes, I have asked my merch guy to order order some of these uh, RGB capable keycaps. So hopefully we'll have some of those soon, but they are gonna cost a bit more. That's the unfortunate thing. The base cost for them is a little bit more, so that's a little bit of the trade-off, but uh, I'm hoping to get some soon. Thank you for your comment. You, you influenced my decision to do that. Here is a group of comments because I got quite a few of these in the last video because uh, I was talking about live streaming because I was unboxing a bunch of Elgato stuff and uh, I just wanted to say thank you all for uh, indicating that you're interested in watching me live stream and I really want to get set up to do that. And in fact, the reason I brought this up at all is because honestly, I didn't really want to be doing this video today. I, I didn't want to leave with that, but it's, it's not that I don't want to do this video. I love doing the Q&A videos and giving you guys some feedback on the questions that you ask. But what I really, really want to be doing right now and what I've wanted to be doing for like the last two weeks and I just can't seem to set aside the right amount of time for it is cleaning up all this crap behind me. My desk is a horrible mess. It's so cluttered. I have so many projects, backlogged projects that haven't gotten put away fully. My work table here is absolutely horrible. So part of the reason I'm doing this Q&A video today and trying to move through it fairly quickly if possible is so that I can work on that. That's my next project for this week is gonna be clean up an organization. And I told myself I need to do that before I get back to the living room stuff, HTPC setup and uh, setting up for some streaming. So if I can be diligent and spend the next 48 to 30, four, four, two to three days working on cleanup and getting a little bit more organized, then I will uh, feel confident enough to move forward with the living room setup. And I'm going to be doing at least a video on getting that stuff set up. And then hopefully also following that up with some actual live streams. But I'm looking forward to it too. So uh, I wanna get that moving soon. Speaking of, let's get through the rest of these questions so I can work on that. The Sleepy Crafts and more says, hey Paul, I've been trying to reach you about your vehicle's extended warranty. I, I would, all right, so obviously I'm too good at ignoring calls because I basically never answer my phone unless it's a number I recognize. Are you guys the same? Do you feel that way about phones? Like how stupid are phones now that the phone function is so useless because of spam calls that you get all the time? 
about your vehicle's warranty or scams or whatever the heck they're doing. Uh, Sleepy Craftsman was obviously making, making, poking a little fun at me there, but uh, you know, it's a good reminder that uh, phones suck these days, I suppose. Here's my last question from, yeah, this is back, Grok. Key Mars, whatever this name actually is, you're apparently from the UK and you're offering to send me beer. And I wouldn't normally be like, hey, people in the UK, send me beer, but since you're offering, yes, you should. That would be really cool. It might cost a lot, and you probably wanna make sure it's packed really well because I have had beer sent to me that uh, didn't quite make the journey okay. But if you're interested in what I like, um, this is one that I've been trying to try again because I haven't tried it since I feel like 2003 or something like that. It's called Caffrey's, it's an Irish ale, and it's one that I used to get at Heroes in, in downtown Fullerton. If any of you guys are, are locals and go to DTF, back when Heroes was at its old location, they had Caffrey's, but then apparently they stopped exporting Caffrey's. I've mentioned this on one of my Q and A's I think before, but honestly, you can probably send me whatever and I'll be happy because uh, I like beer and I've had beer from the UK that's also been good. So thank you for that. And uh, if you do send me something like tweet at me or something to make sure that I get over there and pick it up. I actually checked my PO boxes just again today and they were empty, which is cool. I'm just trying to be more diligent about that to make sure I don't have another fail like what happened last time, which I covered in the other video if you want to check that out. But uh, that's all the time I have for today. Thank you guys so much. I'm gonna wrap things up here and get to work on some cleanup and organization. I'm really looking forward to that. If you enjoyed this video, hit the thumbs up button. Don't forget to leave me a comment uh, for your next Q&A video, which is gonna be a very special Q&A. Should I answer 69 questions for my 69th probing Paul? I, I don't know. They might have to be really short questions, but uh, thanks again for watching this one, you guys, and we'll see you in the next video.